Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming to the Cafe Conversation. When I was putting together the programming for this year, I thought, oh my gosh, October 26, what are we going to do? And then my assistant went, duh, something about the election. It has to be about the election. And so we reached out to the College of Communication, and we were really fortunate that two of their faculty members are brave enough to come and talk. And what do I mean by brave? Yes, we know that this election has been controversial. It has driven us to emotions and other things. But tonight, I'm going to ask all of you to please keep it to conversations, OK? We're going to keep it to what we you know, think, what we believe, but also what we can back by facts, OK? And um, I would encourage you to participate throughout, but everybody should show respect for everybody. Okay, so today's talk is going to be by Amy Edmondson from Journalism and John Grimwade <laughs> from Visual Communications, and they're going to discuss the visual, visual representation, digital representation of data, especially related to the elections. Next week, we have Popped Secret. It is our first movie, Popcorn and a Movie Cafe. And it's especially relevant that we're having popcorn because the movie is about the origin of corn, which it turns out is from this wild grass called Teosinte. Uh, and what they used to do is burn it and make popcorn 9,000 years ago. So we'll learn about that. And then on November 9th, we have our very first graduate student who is going to be doing one of these cafes. She did the science cafes at the North Carolina State Museum, so she has a lot of experience, and she works with Dr. Larry Whitmer, and she does dinosaurs. Her talk is Dinosaurs, Dodos, and Ducks, a Bird's Eye View of Brain Evolution. So I hope that you will join us in the coming weeks. So in other words, we have cafes today, next week, and the following week. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers, please. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So John and I agreed that I would go first because what generally happens is you gather the data, then you visualize it. So I, we thought we'd go in chronological order, and I'm a little bit of a rebel here, sorry. And I have decided that I'm going to do a bit of content that's not the election for a couple of reasons. Uh, because my class, the one I'm kind of selling up here um, to some prospective students out there, as well as a few of the students who have taken this class already, yay, down here in the front, um, wanted to show you what my students do. And a lot of what we do is not election related. So I'm going to try to pop through a few slides pretty quickly, show you some examples of the data that my students gather, and then we'll talk about the election, and then I'll hand it over to John. But by all means, this is supposed to be a conversation. So of course, interrupt me at any time with questions. And the first thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, in memory of uh, Chris Hondros, who was a Viscom uh, photojournalist, um, ma photojournalism major with his masters, who went over to Libya and was killed in 2011. And so when I start my data journalism class, we talk about how, yeah, how are we going to cover this? We're going to profile Chris. We're going to talk to his professors, his family members, his friends. But what else are we going to do to make this story rise above the rest of the stories, to tell the story about Chris, but put the story of Chris in context? So after we profile him, we go and look for data and found some with CPJ.org, Committee to Protect Journalists. And they have been tracking journalists who've been killed in the line of duty since 1992. 1,200 have been killed in the line. And so we download this data from the web, easily downloadable. We are awash in data now. And so there's no reason why most of our stories can't be data-driven stories. And so we try to get our students into a data state of mind with every story, even if it's an incredibly sad profile of an Ohio University VizCom student who was killed in Libya. So we find the data, we isolate it, we find Chris Hondros, 
in the data. And then we filter the data to see just how rare it is for an American journalist to be killed in the line. And 21 people had been. So we zoomed out for that context in a way that would beat, frankly, the competition, um, another media outlet that doesn't know data journalism. And so this guy, a former editor of Slate, said something that really bothered me. So I wanted to take him to task. He said that data journalism, computer-assisted reporting, is literally this new kind of journalism that didn't exist before, I don't know, now. And so I like to say, wrong. And because I am a historian, I'm just going to have you bear with me for a minute to talk about the history of data journalism and data visualization. And we're going to start with predictions. The election from 1952, when you've got the prediction of an Eisenhower win. And the computer was big enough to fit in a room probably about this size, um, but it was actually news, CBS to use, electronic robots to forecast election results. And of course, we had Walter Cronkite, the most trusted man in America, not the most trusted journalist in America. So that's an important distinction to think about when we move into modern day journalism. But um, data journalism as we know it, really from, from a modern standpoint, started in the 1960s with the Detroit race riots. And we have a guy named Phil Meyer, who's really the father of data journalism, old crusty guy. He's a pr retired professor now from Chapel Hill. And he wrote a story in the 1960s about the Detroit riots that said, why, why did this happen? Why do we have these riots? Rather than just interviewing the folks at City Hall and talking to officialdom, he went and put 300 school teachers on the street and had them do a survey and did a statistical analysis um, and really did employ social science techniques in journalism for the first time. And he inspired a lot of folks. And this brought around, uh, around the creation of an organization called Investigative Reporters and Editors, IRE. And what really jump-started this group, of which I'm a member and a lot of my students are, um, is the death of a journalist named Don Bowles, who was covering organized crime in Phoenix. And he was killed um, by the mob, by the mafia, for his investigation. Now, how many of you have been to the museum in D.C.? Have you seen Don Bowles' car? So they blow him up. It's the white car in the corner on, like, the third floor. And they blow him up. Um, and it, the, the bomb is under his seat. And so as a result, this fledgling group called IRE, Investigative Reporters and Editors, descend upon Phoenix and finish that investigation far down. And it's a famous project called the Arizona Project, where reporters from the New York Times, Dallas, Los Angeles, all around the country come in and finish Don's work. And so that really solidifies the organization that, that really leads internationally in data journalism. It's IRE, and it's through NICAR, the National Institute of Computer Assisted Reporting. And that's how we do our training here at Ohio. And so what you have are journalists, working journalists, along with students, and we spend our spring breaks and our summers going to uh, additional training because the technology is constantly changing and we want to keep up with it. And so we talk about how our, our students, um, can journalism students get jobs in this day and age in, in, in an era of layoffs? And so there were so many job boards, I just had to put them up. These are wanted, you know, we want data journalists. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And then, of course, I get on Twitter and I'm like, yay, it's spring break and we're learning about data. Everybody else is in Florida. Are we idiots? No, we're smart. And so um, just a couple of, of little plugs for my students who really do spend spring break and summers going for training. A couple of other non-related election topics before I move in um, for the 2016 election. And this is, even if you are not a journalism major, maybe you're doing something more related to corporate communications, um, maybe something that's going to be more public relations, you've got data analysts at the NFL who created a spreadsheet um, when all the discussion was going on about concussions and football. And so they released this spreadsheet, and it turns out the data team at the New York Times, which is really good, as you might imagine, um, went through this spreadsheet where every row was a concussion example. And they found tons and tons of concussions that the NFL didn't list in their spreadsheet. And that tells us then that spreadsheets can be crap. 
And so what we do is we spend some time in our classes going, hey, don't dazzle me with a spreadsheet. It may not be any good. And so that's going to have some um, applicability, I would argue, when we talk about the election. A couple more real quick examples. Um, obviously, police brutality post-Ferguson 2014 is a very big deal. Newspapers around the country started looking for data. Okay, we know when a police officer is shot and killed in the line, but what about when an officer kills a citizen? That data was not in an existence in any kind of spreadsheet form. One of the better newspaper um, efforts was the Palm Beach Post, but the Washington Post ended up winning a Pulitzer this year for its analysis of the instances where a police officer kills a citizen. All right, and this you can download the data, and so data journalists like me see this, and we're like, oh, this is so exciting because we are awash in data. And so GitHub, how many of you guys are familiar with GitHub? All right, so this is a place, typically kind of a nerdy place where people get together and share code. And so the Washington Post uses its GitHub site or this particular reporter and says, here we go, it's a CSV file, comma separated value, which means I can download it and look at the data. And so we have here a compilation of every fatal shooting in the United States um, that I think is really important work. Last example that's non-election, and then I'm getting there, and that is what's not to love about Spotlight and Marty Baron. And so who's seen Spotlight, the movie? Okay, so if you haven't seen it, run. Don't walk to Netflix, all right? And so we had Marty Baron here. Here's Marty Baron and then Liev Schreiber. Um, who played Marty, um, who engineered and, and, and edited that story for the Boston Globe. And so, as you know, um, that story won a Pulitzer um, in the early 2000s, but got a lot of attention when the film won an Oscar. And so I, e I uh, emailed the data team um, last semester when I was trying to show how easy um, spreadsheet analysis can be, and within an hour, uh, the Globe guys, such big names in our field, said, here, here's the data. Sure, show it to your students. Do whatever you want to with it. With it. And it was really exciting and kind of shows how um, giving the data journalism community is. So another fun data set, all of the 3,900 OU employees' salaries, sorted highest to lowest, our highest paid person, though you can't see it, is who? Basketball coach, followed by? Football coach, it's a conversation about what we value um, in terms of our, uh, um, okay, anyway. So, now, you can tell I'm an academic, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, here we are. Um, one of my favorite, Gordon. You talk about the people freely sharing their data. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so what would happen, um, repeat the question, why in the world would the Washington Post spend all that, that time compiling, for example, the 1,200 um, instances of um, uh, police uh, shootings and then share it? They put it in the paper first. They put it on their website first, and then they say, sure, here you go. So yeah, there is a little bit of, I think, proprietary um, activity there. But then there'll be instances where you might just want to carve out the data from your part of the world and do something local or regional. Um, so, great question. In this instance, what we hear a lot every election cycle is, it's not fair that Air Force One and taxpayers are paying for the president to campaign for the Democratic or the Republican um, nominee. And so every four years, you see this story. It's, it's interesting because if a Republican president is in the White House, the Democrats are going to complain, and vice versa. And so what I have is a 2012 story here where it says, hey, this is uncool. President Obama is in Florida, and he's talking up the Affordable Care Act, but wait, he's also going to be doing um, some stomping, some, some electioning, uh, some campaigning for the Democratic nominee. And so Mark Knoller, a reporter for CBS, is in that packed journalism that is the White House correspondence, right? And so he stands out among all of the other correspondents because he's a data journalist. And so what he did was, every time you've got wheels up, he puts it in a spreadsheet. Wherever Air Force One goes, 
there's an item of data, okay? And so what happened when this last round of complaints occurred where you've got a Democratic president who is using Air Force One? Um, the, the story then that, we, that comes out is that President Obama did it, President Bush did it, President Clinton did it, the other president, Bush, did it, and he's been keeping records for 25 years. And so all the other media outlets then are quoting Mark Knoller's story. New York Times is saying, according to CBS News. So it's like, whoa, big fail on the New York Times part, because really the only person who had that story journalistically, context-wise, more than just a, oh, let's complain and let's, re let's rebut, the true context came with Mark Knoller. So I'm a big fan. Now, Ohio elections. Now, this is um, something that my students and I use quite a bit. And, and I wanted to share something with you that my students really enjoyed, and that is with the campaign finance reports, pretty solid. We always use this data. Um, you can just download it, anybody can, from the Ohio Secretary of State's office. Um, and so, interestingly, um, simple search, click, and that's what journalists do. Back in the day, I was a reporter for about a dozen years, um, if you can't tell from my accent, mostly in the South. And so, we would have to schlep over to the Election Commission, grab the hard copies of the election campaign finance reports, and go and enter the data ourselves into spreadsheets. But now you can just download it, anybody can, um, very quickly, and we do. And so what we looked at was the Kasich data um, in Ohio, and a really fun um, line you can't really tell here, but this is the the campaign the person who um, who contributes to the campaign. That's their occupation. And so what we did, and I thought this would be interesting for my students, was we isolated it. Their occupation is student. And so then my students are like, wait, wait a minute, somebody just donated, and you can't see it here, I'm sorry, um, $11,999 to, to, to Kasich's campaign? I can't even pay my rent. I'm eating ramen. How in the world are they donating almost $12,000, which would be the state limit at the time, um, the last gubernatorial election? How are they doing that? So we isolate the data and slice it and dice it. And I'm sorry that you can't see this, but what I did was we pulled out all the kids and then we looked for their parents. Okay, and so what you've got is an Ohio law that says you have to be seven years old to contribute to a, a campaign. Isn't that a fun story? You know, that's one that as a journalist I'm pretty excited about because I hadn't read it before. Um, and so there's no Ohio statute limiting the amount a family can give. And so then there are several of these that you can't really, and this is why we need data visualization, John coming soon, because this is hideous to look at, right? You can't even really tell what's going on here. But we've grouped together families, prominent families, and then they, all their kids donate and their, um, their spouses and, and find a nice little story there that maybe others wouldn't find. Now here's the Federal Election Commission data. Also, disclosure data catalog, really awesome thing. Anybody can, can just go click, click, and download this data. And so, in this instance, what we are looking at as, uh, is who donated, how much, what it was spent on. You know, you have the campaign, the campaigns that say, hey, grassroots, grassroots. So you could do a search for anybody who donated under $500 and tally those up, and we can, we can see who the small donors are. So there's a million ways to slice and dice this data. Um, and though we do have um, Super PACs and Citizens United um, have sort of blunted the impact of some of the stories, um, it's still really interesting to tell a lot of these stories and to tell them well. Um, and so I'm not going to do a whole lot with this because um, John's about to get up here, but uh, the, the key, I think, individual in terms of data analysis is Nate Silver in 538. Y'all familiar? Okay, all right. So, so with this, this is what's getting a lot of attention. And with 538, these predictors, I think, are really interesting because you're kind of like, well, how in the world do they know? And this is way above anything that, that I understand, frankly. And so I went to his website to try to get a better understanding of how he does that, and I pulled off a user's guide to the how, how to understand the probabilities. Here it is. It's 19 pages, but he explains how he gets the probabilities, and it's fascinating. And so um, 
the, the notion that he is simulating the election 10,000 times and produces a distribution of probable outcomes for each state gives us um, what we know about this probability. It's statistical modeling that's way over my head, but Nate Silver really is sort of the gold standard, I think, um, that John's going to talk a little bit more about. And the last thing that I want to leave you with before we move over to the more, much more interesting visualization is an article that I wanted to recommend to you from the Washington Post. And it's the notion that we really no longer have the media um, and the, the idea of the media. It's anybody with a cell phone, anybody with um, a Twitter handle who's on Facebook, anybody with any kind of website. And so when you lump the media together, I just want to urge caution um, that when you, um, when you do that, you're talking about anybody with a cell phone um, or not. So when we think about um, reliability in election data, it's really important to look at where that source is. So I'm going to leave it there and let John talk more about that. And we'll have time for some questions, hopefully, at the end. Yeah, that would be me. Um, hi. As you can tell uh, from my accent, I grew up in Pomeroy. <laughs> A lot of people here think that I have some kind of connection to Masterpiece Theatre, to be honest. So I apologize in advance. Um, yeah, this, uh, I put myself into the <laughs> cast, as you can see. Um, I'm also, I'm sponsored by Kroger. I get quite a large fee, as you'll see, for about to mention them. Uh, I was in Kroger at the checkout. I'm looking at journalism there, and I'm just thinking, what the hell is going on here? This is complete rubbish. You know, like, they're not the king and the queen. It's just nonsense. I think we'll be really, really careful when looking at the media. Um, I been living through Brexit, of course, and Brexit was, um, well, kind of shocking because all of the polls predicted that we would be staying in Europe. So I think we should be cautious about all predictions at the moment because uh, look what happened in Britain. Everybody was totally confident on the morning of the vote that it was going to be a clear decision to stay in Europe, and the shock later was staggering. So. I know there's a lot of prediction about the election result being set in stone, but I think we should keep an open mind going forwards because I lived through Brexit in June and it was a shocker watching BBC TV as the thing unfolded. I mean, look at this in the Washington Post the next day. As you probably know, Google was almost brought to the point of collapse by Brits trying to find out what Brexit actually was, having voted in favour of it. They're like, oh... What is the European Union? That's what all the questions were things like, yeah, what's the EU? <laughs> why didn't they do that before the vote? So many people in Britain now are saying, why did I vote to pull out? The pound's tanked. <laughs> um, and, you know, they had a similar thing to the Nate Silver thing in a way. This is from The Guardian, where you can see, uh, yeah, really kind of scary image there. And the ridiculous distortion of the UK... Uh, which they've, this is a cardiogram, I'll be talking about it in a moment. You've got to know the shape of Britain to understand what that is doing there. Um, I just want to show you a couple of logo things. You may have seen this, but it always makes me smile. This is the uh, Obama logo from 2012, and someone on social media flipped it upside down and recolored it, and uh, I thought it was kind of genius, to be honest. <laughs> just a quick flip, and we have something else. Um, this, of course, is Hillary Clinton's logo. I, I, when I walk home to Sunnyside Drive, I pass the office there and I see this logo all the time. Um, and someone's made an alphabet font so we can, you know, make headlines in this font. Who wants to do that? I'm not too sure. But I always feel about this logo that I'm expecting to see it on the side of a delivery truck. <laughs> I really am. I, I, I'm not wild about it. Um, the biggest thing I want to talk about is the election map because... For people in my business, they are really always worried about the election map. And 
It goes back a long way. This is actually rather well done from 1880. So data visualization of the election is nothing new. Um, and if you look at the map we're used to seeing, here it is, the geographic map. And on this site, 270 to win, you can see it for every year, which is kind of interesting. You can go all the way back to right the way back. You'll see I went back here to uh, a very long way. And, you know, this is the traditional election map that we're used to seeing. Um, here, incidentally, is what it would look like if just men were voting on election day. Uh, that would be the election map. And if it was women, it would look like that, which is pretty interesting. I have no further comment on that, except it's interesting. Um, and while we're on the question of that, look at Alaska down here. I don't know if any of you know how big Alaska is, but they're used to being shown like that, and they're kind of pissed about it. And here's why. Here's the size of Alaska. Who knew? It's gigantic. I mean, I think that's a big problem right there. Um, but this is the map that has been used. Look, historically, every election has used this, uses this geographic map. And the problem, of course, is that the, it shows the area, the land area. There might be states with very few electoral college votes, but they happen to cover a huge area. So the result doesn't reflect that geographic distribution. So that map is inherently flawed, although we see it all the time. Obviously, there are small states like Massachusetts with a lot of electoral college votes. There are big states with only a couple. So that's something to bear in mind. The, the New York Times addressed this rather well after the last election by creating an incredible interactive online, which has it shown in, the results shown in all kinds of different ways, like using bubbles, proportional circles, and it's historic. You can look at it through all the different viewpoints. I really love this kind of visualization where we get this kind of depth. We can go into counties. This is really incredible data. And of course, they are obviously planning to do it for the upcoming election. And you'll be able to go in and analyze the result, compare it to previous elections in amazing depth and kind of build your own visualization, really. And I, 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 this, for me, uh, is a terrific piece of work that really allows us to mine the data. We can really see where Southern Baptists are. Um, you know, we can look at everything every little metric here, I think it's an incredible thing. With, when you think of the layers of data here, uh, it's really incredible. It's like this pyra amazing pyramid of data. And that's the beauty of data visualization. Yeah. It's a um, New York Times online interactive that was put online after the last election to enable their readers to analyze the result. Yeah. So it was on their website. Still is, I think. And they will be updating it, of course, with the new election data, which, of course, they get from government data. Um, here, here's the cardiogram point here, where we see, I think it's from the Wall Street Journal. There is the, uh, there is the map from the polls done geographically, from current polls. But if we click on cardiogram, and you can see here, we can't even get these states on, really, clearly, under this system because, of course, on the East Coast, they're so compressed. But there's the cardiogram, where we now see it proportional to electoral college votes. So to me, this is diagram, and the other one is map. And I'm really a diagram person, because I'm trying to communicate the data. And I don't think geography is necessarily the right way. There is the real UK, to get back to Brexit. Look at this nutty distortion that has been done here to reflect how many voters there are in each area. You've really got to know the UK shape. The danger of the cardiogram is that if you don't know the shape of the country, it sort of throws you. It can throw you considerably. Here, here we are. I mean, there is the United Kingdom, and here is the Guardian's cardiographic mashup. Um, talking about polls, this was kind of sad, I thought. Uh, I just got this a couple of days ago when we see that almost one of the biggest bars is people who dislike both candidates. I think that's a sad reflection on where we are, really. Um, perhaps we don't love the choices. 
So this is the sort of thing we're used to seeing everywhere. I don't know how many of us really pay much attention to this, really. When I look at this, in this particular case, from USA Today, especially being in here, it just makes me want a coffee, to be honest, because my eye keeps going into that ad. Uh, that's the curse of the online, isn't it? Friggin' ads just bouncing up everywhere. You end up just looking at an ad for Nespresso rather than a very important <laughs> election statement. Um, and you have to be careful where you look in, in polls. Here we see for Ohio with um, Clinton slightly ahead of Trump. It's very close. But, you know, there's, you've got to look at it at all kinds of levels to get the true picture. There's no simple picture because if we look at the race for Senate, we see a completely different thing happening here. So, I, you know, it's not, like, it's not necessarily easy to get one clear result. Um, 538 that Amy mentioned, the thing about 538 is that it isn't just politics. It covers sports, uh, science, economics, and culture. And uh, Nate Silva started out working baseball statistics. That was his thing. It was um, like sabermetrics. It was like a predictive data for baseball. He wasn't politics at all. He moved into politics from there. He's a statistician, pure and simple. And this is his prediction, for instance, for the World Series. And the Indians, of course, are moving in the right direction there, having won game one. See if he's right later on. This is based on tons of data, of course. Um, and, of course, many people know this, um, this, this prediction. It's just a prediction. Of course, it's not a poll. Some people seem to think it's some kind of poll. They're like, wow, Hillary Clinton's at 84.7%. Well, of course she isn't. It's his prediction based on a mass of algorithms. It's a different thing altogether. As Amy mentioned, he has a 19-page methodology of how he came about that. If you go to the site, though, it's incredibly detailed in every level. And why I really like it is because it uses every type of charting method to get the message across. And I think you'll see in a second here how, as hopefully scores up, yeah, we have everything. We have fever charts, bar charts, pie charts. He tries to come at it from every angle. At state level, at every part of the race is charted. And what makes it more sound for me, because I'm suspicious of all data, I really am, a lot of data is flawed. He also has downloadable data sets. You can make your own charts to see if you agree with his charts. Um, of course, you wouldn't be applying his algorithm, but look at all the poll data. This is what's driving this. It's this massive, frankly, quite scary data that drives this site and ends up with that prediction. That's a prediction of victory. And here's the cardiogram that I mentioned. You know, he's got little diagrams. He's got every kind of thing happening. Yes? Is he including every poll he can I think he's... In the oh, sorry. Um, yes, the question was, is he including every poll? Um, that is a very good question. I'm not sure I exactly know the answer to that. I know this includes a shocking number of polls. Um, So his people do a lot of research to see which polls are bogus and which ones are not. And he, he literally has a link on that long web site that's got the 19-page printout. Um, it's here, click here for the banned pollster list. These are the people we're not going to use, and here's why their methodology is flawed. Hey. Yeah. Hey, I learned something there. Um, I means the person for data, that's for sure. Um, I just want to wind up here with something about facts because having come from a journalistic background, um, I'm kind of interested in the facts. I don't doubt that we're all very worried about terrorism. Of course we are. And that's a real threat. Um, but look at this. You have more chance of your clothes spontaneously melting or igniting than you have of being killed by immigrant-linked terrorism. Um, or being hit by a train. So I think we just got to keep the correct perspective there. Why do I mention this? Because I saw this all over Twitter. Um, this isn't so much a political statement as a statement about accuracy. Um, in fact, it's entirely that. 
It's just about the facts, because it isn't true to say that in a bowl of Skittles, if I told you just three would kill you, would you take a handful? Donald Trump Jr. said this. It's just not true. It's absolutely not true. I've worked on many visualizations about terrorism. I knew the moment I saw this that this is not true. How could it possibly be true? It is not true. In fact, as Vox pointed out, you would need 10.9 billion Skittles to be sticking your hand in to find the three that were going to kill you. You would need, as you can see, a bowl this size of Skittles. And that is a fact. The other one is not. In fact, if we look at causes of death, um, being killed by domestic terrorism would fall between storm and lightning there on the right. But look at the other ones we should be worrying about. Choking. I nearly choked the other day in a restaurant. Um, walking. Let's, well, my point here is let's always stick with the facts. Whoever we support, wherever we're going in the election, let's just try and stick with the facts. People will try and tell us things to worry us and frighten us and sway us, but always question the data and look for the truth. And I think that's really a very important point. Um, if you want to go really nutty, you can download a countdown clock if you're really into this election thing. Or even put it on your website. It's counting us down by the seconds to the election, to the moment we get the result. There we go. I'm really excited as it ticks down. <laughs> Not. Um, <laughs> and this was in the Athens News, uh, like yesterday. And I think this is the point we've now reached, to be honest. I think we're just ready for the campaign to be over. And thank you for listening. I appreciate it. <laughs> so I guess if anyone has a question for Amy or I, please go ahead. Yes. I, I think it, that is true, but it's a surprising trend. Oh, sorry. The question was, I believe, was the, has the funding for data decreased? So we actually have less data and less money behind the data in this election than any before. And I believe that's true. And also that there's less advertising in this election than any of the preceding 10 elections or something, which is odd. It's as, almost as if the enthusiasm level has gone through the floor, which could be true, I think, if we see that thing of how many people don't like either candidate. So, but um, that is a, a strange trend considering how much big data is growing and the data visualization business is growing. I think it's more reflects, it's a tricky one to answer, but I think it reflects somehow how we're all feeling about this entire process, which has a kind of negative, general negative air about it. And I, perhaps that is a factor in that lack of funding. I think we're still awash in data. We really are. It's easier to get. It used to take a lot of manpower, as I mentioned, have to schlep down to the election commission, get all those paper documents, enter the data. And now you can just sit at your computer and go click, click. Anybody can. Um, so the, the data are there. And I think the polling is, is really considerable. There's so many polls. Um, one of them that I was just looking at earlier today um, in terms of looking at uh, which ones do you trust, which ones do you look for, I always go to Politico um, in addition to 538 and some of these others. But Bloomberg um, had a poll that was just done, and so they'll, they'll take all of these different polls, and this one was October 21 through 24, it's at the very bottom of the story, and says reaching 953 likely voters. So that's not very many, right? 953 likely voters in Florida. And then that study um, has a margin of error of plus or minus 3.2% um, based on the statistical modeling. And then it says at the bottom of this Bloomberg story that they believe they oversampled Hispanics by 148 of the 953 likely voters. And so you have these just so many different polls. They're very small. And then what's so interesting about what Nate Silver does is that he takes all of those together and considers them. So I think we, we will remain awash in data, even though you do see 
fewer working journalists for these legacy media outlets. Yeah. Turn off. Ah, I found it. Sorry. Must be over there, I think. Sorry. Um, yeah, you're asking whether all this polling really adds up to anything, all this absurd amount of polling. I myself am very suspicious of a lot of it. A lot of it, and I would say this about any kind of data visualization you ever see. I mean, I, this might sound obvious, but don't just accept it. I see all the time, whenever I look at anything that's been visualized from data, I ask myself, I look at it and I think, is this sound? What is the sampling rate? How many people are involved here? And I think polling is a very shaky area. I agree with you. I mean, we're just told polls all the time that veer wildly all over the show. I mean, I don't know if Nate Silver's right with his algorithms to try and sort this out, but it is a, it's a monstrous thing, isn't it? It really is. Yeah. How would you, could you walk us through the process of how you would visualize those data from that kind of poll? Okay. Well, I think if you're charting that kind of poll, oh, sorry, I apologize. Um, yeah, I think the question was about charting a, a shaky poll. Um, well, I, I basically wouldn't use that poll. There's no way with a low sampling rate like that, with that much you know, room, that much margin of error. Um, I just don't think that's sound data. The, in, in my business, you, I really need like data analysts before me to have gone through the data, Amy, for instance, and tell me what to use, because I'm not really qualified to make that call. And of course, once you visualize it, you've almost cast it in stone, and people then accept that as some kind of Truth. I mean, once you see it done as an infographic, it's the truth, isn't it? It's like, yes, now, now it's the truth. But is it? Right. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Amy, you mm. should answer that. Well, one good thing about, I hate to keep going back to the 538 um, example, but what is so cool is there is a link to sort of, you know, suspect polls, polls where the methodology is suspect. Um, and so that's a really handy place to go. And you go, oh, that's not going to work. Um, so I think it's easier than ever now to see which polls are legit and which ones are not based on that transparency um, that I think all media outlets um, are, are using um, because they say, this is how we did it. This is, our, this is exactly how we did it, et cetera. This is where it might be weak. Um, but I totally agree with your point that we have way too much polling and way too much horse race um, coverage. And I think that's a classic problem. And one of the reasons why um, uh, journalists like Mark Knoller from CBS News and his work is so exciting because he's the guy going, what is nobody else writing about? Um, what, what can I write that nobody else has read? And so that, that packed journalism mentality um, you know is alive and well and, and has been for many many decades but it's fun when you see somebody do something just a little bit different right, it's not me So it's the idea that um, does data help us or hinder us 
when we're talking about search, the search for truth? Hmm. Really, I think it, uh, you use data the way, and this is what I tell my students, um, it's a source of information. And so when we weigh who we're going to interview for a story, um, we go through a number of things. Um, is this source tr trustworthy? Um, when it, what is their background? Um, what is their history? What is their motivation for talking to me, the journalist? Um, and so you vet your sources for credibility. And so what I tell my students is you also look at that data as just one more source of information. Okay, where did it come from? What's its history? Who created it? Um, because all of that data is man-made. Somebody typed that into um, an Excel spreadsheet or, or some other um, piece of software. And so you have to interrogate and question that data the same way you would um, a human source. And so that's, I think, one way to, to sort of think through, um, should I use this or not? Um, and then, of course, as much training as we can give on sound um, data analysis methods right. and, and making sure that I don't misunderstand data. I would uh, say, okay, find a colleague, whether they're in my newsroom or maybe they're a friend I met through IRE, investigative reporters and editors. I'll send them the spreadsheet and go, okay, this is how I look at this. This is how I analyzed it. Did I miss anything? Did I get this right? Just kind of be my safety net here and make sure I got this, this right. So those are just a few thoughts on, on how to handle um, the incredible amount of information we get um, and we have to turn around really quickly with it. I think okay. one factor to really watch out for is that there's a lot of crappy data around and a lot of people visualizing it and there's not as much rigor being applied on handling the data. So of course, go online and do any kind of search. There's 10 million charts about everything but they're mostly 99.9% .9 crap because They've just used any old bit of data they picked up from anywhere. And that's something I would really watch out for. I sort of mentioned that a little bit earlier, but I, it really, really worries me. Everyone's a data visualizer now, but they don't have a story. You know, they're just presenting this stuff out without any, any journalistic rigor at all. And that worries me greatly because there are... And then people are repeating it as if it's some kind of fact. They're like, well, did you know that this number of people... Like, Whoa! Where did that come from? See what I mean? That's the danger um, and why the data police, as I call them, are needed. You know, we need to go and look at these things and make sure they're sound. Because when something is done as a piece of graphic design, as, you know, it becomes, it has another reality somehow. Now it becomes the truth. But it's just as flawed as that crazy remark someone threw off in passing. Yeah. I think they... Yeah, the question was whether the major media outlets are applying these same criteria to the things they're producing. Um, in some good cases they are, but I see a lot of mainstream media that's really shaky, and that does worry me greatly. It's almost as if, if it's going to be shown as an image, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to have the same rules applied to it. That really, really worries me because journalism is journalism and you can't just switch off when, because you're making a visualization. You can't be like, you know, that kind of attitude. It's like, oh, this doesn't matter. You know, it's just a chart kind of thing. No, it matters a lot. Can I piggyback on, off yeah, that sorry. just for a second? Um, one thing that I, I find very heartening is we will have um, a, an amazing group of guest speakers come through. The head of virtual reality at USA Today is Bobcat. And then we'll have guys who come in who do all these cool interactive apps for the New York Times. And they're coding, and they're doing data analysis, and they're doing all these neat bells and whistles. And then the students we, who we, we bring um, before all these experts who come to visit, um, the students will go, so how do I get to where you are? Wow, you're head of VR for USA Today. Um, or augmented reality, so it's either AR or VR, that's a big hot thing. Um, how do I, what do I do to be like you? And without fail, 
th these individuals in these high up places within our industry say, first, learn how to be a good reporter and a good writer. Yeah. That right. lays the baseline, and I'm like, oh, thank you. Yeah, because <laughs> the bells and whistles will come, and we kind of joke in the journalism and Viscom departments because, okay, we're supposed to be building unicorns now, and they don't exist. What's a unicorn in the journalism world? Okay, I'm a great reporter. I'm a great writer. I can do AR, VR, video, audio, cool podcast. Ooh, look at my visualizations. It's like, wait a minute. Hmm. Not one person can do all of that stuff. And so what we hope to do then is try to stick to the basics initially. Let's not forget our roots and that you're a great reporter and a great writer first. Will, you've been playing. <laughs> um, all right, well, I, my question is about like, how the information is just like, physically gathered, especially if like, people might not be interested in either candidate or if they're less willing to like, accept from call forums or like, the phone call polling issue is a big one because of, of how do we gather the information um, such as I don't want either candidate um, and so with polling obviously a lot of people don't have landlines anymore and so it's much more difficult to get a hold of people um, people as, as people migrate to their cell phones we don't have home phones anymore and so that can be even uh, more of a challenge for some of those professional pollsters um, as they adapt and everybody moves to um, that environment. Great question. Gordon? I think you had a comment that was very discouraging about the engagement group that uh, you can't really even count on like the major media houses doing a good job of, of vetting the data and properly analyzing it and presenting it. So what the heck does the consumer really do? We don't have the time or the wherewithal to track all that down on our own and say, yeah, that was good data or it wasn't. Yeah, you're, I don't know how you can do anything but, but have your outdoor crew that you just kind of trust and you trust right. outlets on polar opposite sides of the political spectrum depending on who they are. Well, I saw it there. I, I can't get to meet with it. Yeah, the question was, yeah, the question was about my discouraging remark about major, major media outlets and, and the general quality of the data and the quality of the visualization. Well, yeah, I'm sorry to be such a downer on that, but you know, I'm really, really worried about it because the data visualization field is shot forwards and I'm some really nervous that that, that that sort of rigorous approach has not followed it. Probably it has in the case, say, of the New York Times or Washington Post, and, and I think you can sort of feel the credibility in those outlets up, you know, to a certain extent. But across the most of the ma massive media, I am nervous about that. I feel that most of the visualizations are somewhat impenetrable. They're not that damaging because no one can understand them or use them. So they're probably not doing that much damage because no one can get at the data anyway. That's one of my, I mean, I have many concerns about this. I, I feel the cart got before the horse or something here. And I'm sorry that it is discouraging, but I feel that we need to get a real grip on that and make sure that, that we move forward in the right way. I think we're going through a difficult phase here with a lot of blogs and people posting crazy stuff and making graphics who shouldn't be making them. And hopefully it's just a bump on the road to the information heaven. But uh, I, I take your point, though. It is worrying. I mean, I tend to, I tend to find some of the big sources like the New York Times, the Washington Post, Boston Globe, credible, mostly, I would say. And I know that they're trying really hard to be. So I do trust those. I was really referring more to the great mass of the internet. And it's true, you've got to be so careful before you say that in a dinner conversation later in the day, because the people look at you and they're like, he must be mad. Where did he get that from? That worries me greatly. And we take it as the truth, you know, so. I am much more optimistic than John about um, the, the mainstream legitimate journalism that's still going on. Um, what I am more concerned about, uh, and Marty Barron expressed this at an IRE conference I was at in New Orleans with my students in June. And, and, and Marty Barron is the editor of, of now of the Washington Post, but was at the Globe for, for the Spotlight series. Okay, so you, what you've got now are two truths. 
you've got media on the left and you have media on the right and you've got these two separate narratives that, are, that have been built up. And so his concern, which I thought was very eloquently put, was how can we have a, 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 a democracy, a, a truly um, effective democracy that's not dysfunctional um, when you have two truths and these are accepted, or several truths, but on either end of the spectrum. That, to me, is much more concerning. But I take heart in the fact that our country has been, was started this way. Um, and so if you think about John Adams and the Federalists, and Thomas Jefferson and the Jeffersonian Republicans, that was a party press that was vicious. And they existed to attack each other. Right? And then we moved away from the party press um, from the dawning of our time into a much more um, objective press um, with Walter Cronkite being the most trusted man in America, not the most trusted journalist in America. And then we've moved away from that back to a party press system, which that, that's our roots, and we've kind of returned to that. Um, and it can be problematic, obviously. Where was the hand? Yeah, this one too? Yeah. We'll be we'll be pithy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tough question Ooh. at the end of, wow, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, the question is how I avoid bias in the, I believe, in the use of data with visual communication students. You know, I try and be like relentlessly fair. It may not have seemed it, but I do. Um, I try not to let my opinions, I, I really do try not to let my opinions color the picture. And I, I constantly stress to all of my students to, to take that, noble journalistic road, you know? And that's the road, of course, we have to take or try to take. Of course we do. We have to try and be impartial. I know it's difficult, and people want to put a slant one way or the other for various reasons, sometimes for reasons of impact, but I'm constantly questioning that. I'm like, are you sure that that really looks like it could work for anybody? I think you've got to be really careful and be inclusive. If, we're not, if we don't do that, then what, where are we going, really? We have to include everyone, and uh, that is the only way forward. So I, I like to think I try and do that, but I take your point, because people will try and put their own implications into it. They really will. But I'm constantly trying to check that and really looking critically at visualizations and saying, you know, is that your personal opinion there? Why have you done it like that? You've already cast it in a certain direction before we've even looked at it. It has to come to us in a more neutral way so that we make the choices. I think that's the crucial thing there. Last question. Yes, so um, I understand and the appeal is wrong for the scares and the dangers and the things that we talk about. But if more people can be killed by doing what you're saying, you can. And if someone is using it to look at the data that you presented, it would explain the opinion of a person. Because most people just use polls or Yeah. Right. What was the question? Uh, the question is that, okay, we can look at, I believe, we can look at the hard facts, say, about terrorism statistics or whatever, but in fact, we're more influenced, correct me if I'm wrong, we're more influenced by polls and people's other not factual points to think that, for instance, it's emotive. They have a reason for pushing forward the idea, for instance, that we should be scared of a certain thing. And you can back it up with polls where people of 90% agreed with that. Is that, is that the yeah, kind of your question? Yeah, okay. <laughs> the other one was, what if the polls are back in your mouth are also false? Because if they're sending polls and people are saying that terrorism is bad, there's reason people got killed by terrorists, by terrorist attacks, and then polls are back in your mouth. Yeah. The polls are wrong, the data's wrong, the whole point's wrong. Well, all you can do there is try and correct that. That's all 
we can do is try and correct that thinking. I agree with you, that is a tricky area and that's why we have a lot of fears about different things. We don't look at the numbers, do we? Like we're, we're all slightly scared of flying, but flying is so safe, it's ridiculous. If we look at the numbers, we're at so much risk when we get in our car and drive you know, along State Street than we are going to the airport, but we don't believe that because of various opinions, polls, things we've seen about people's fears. It, this is a tricky area. Um, I don't know the easy answer to that, I'm afraid, how we correct that. And of course, politicians will use things to make points and look for data that appears to support that. It's, it's, a, it's a minefield, really. Thank you very much.